The Sit Rep Podcast is sponsored by Black Sight Studio, the creators of incredible pre-color terrain. Whether you're looking for terrain in 28 or 15 millimeter, they have a wide selection just for you. No matter the type of game, Black Sight Studio has exactly what you are looking for. They have new releases all the time, and their catalog continues to grow. So the next time you're considering new terrain, jump over to Black Sight Studio, and you will find just what you need. Remember to let them know you heard from us. Black Sight Studio, the official sponsors of the Sit Rep Podcast. You are listening to the Sit Rep Podcast, your home for everything related to modern wargaming. Whether it's reviews, rules analysis, play-by-plays, hobby time, or even gameplay videos, we will bring it all to you. And now for your hosts. From England, we have Ralph from the great white north of Canada, Chris, our historical editor, Big Jim Ariskany, and G, both from the United States. And now, sit back, relax, and get ready for the ultimate ride into modern wargaming. Hello, everybody. This is G from the Sit Rep Podcast, and you are listening to the next exciting episode. Today, I have a full house on board. We have people from all over the globe-ish. So, um, representing the other side of the Atlantic is Ralph in merry old England. Hi, folks. We have our historical guru, Jim Ariskany from sunny Florida. Hey, everyone. How you doing? And we have a very special guest in house today. It is Tim from Footsore Miniatures or Footsore North America to talk about what's going on with Footsore and especially moderns. Tim, welcome back to the show. Well, thank you very much. We're very excited to have you. It's been a while since you've been on the show. Those who have been listening and following us since the beginning will remember Tim. Um, He was on a few of our very first episodes and brought a lot of great information and content to the show. We are very happy to have you back. And I know you've had an extremely busy year since then. Um, Why don't you kind of fill us in on what's going on? Well, uh, as you mentioned before, I was on the show, I guess, probably the first or second one. I can't remember. So yeah. it has been some time. Uh, and, and at the time, I was Special Arts and Service Miniatures. That was the company. I started that in 2015. And my very first range I came out with was a, a Kickstarter I did called Contractor Benghazi. I was very happy with that. It was it was, it was fun to do. You know, I learned a lot from that that Kickstarter so then I'm just, you know, tooling along and creating different different ranges for special artisan. And Footsore, the company over in England, caught my attention. Sp- specifically, Andy Hobday and Mark Farr, who Andy is very, very active on social media. And we started talking about uh, different opportunities that, that, that I uh, had and that I could offer the company. And uh, through that, those meetings, they decided to have me become part of Footsore. So I am now Footsore North America, where I produce the miniatures for Footsore. Uh, both the, well, we started off with the Mortal Gods ranges. Uh, and the Mortal Gods is a 28 millimeter ancient mm-hmm. skirmish game. We thought that was best to offer the community uh, right off the bat because uh, of the game Mortal Gods uh, being produced. We wanted to be able to support uh, North America here. And then uh, we, I, we, I will also be producing the Dark Ages ranges, anything that really Footsore um, produces. I personally am excited to get the uh, very English Civil War figures. Mm-hmm. Uh, that that inner war period uh, between, I believe it's set at ni- 1919 to 1937. Uh, some would say that, that that that's not modern. However, uh, it has a lot of opportunities. So it, it's I'm, I'm very excited about that. Awesome. So I have to say, I, I really enjoy uh, Footsore miniatures. Um, every year when they're at Adepticon, I pick up the special edition miniatures, or you know when they have their they had the month uh, monthly special edition miniature. So I have the Odin um, mm-hmm. one, which is amazing. Um, I have one that almost controversial in some aspects, and that's the Blood Eagle. Um, yep. I love that miniature. It's gruesome. 
Don't get me wrong, um, but it's well done, and I, you know, I don't think it's distasteful. Any, it just literally shows what a blood eagle is. Uh, for anybody who's not familiar with it, check out the Vikings. Uh, they do an excellent representation of it. <laughs> oh Twice. Lord, have mercy! Um, and then I have. What is the other one? The, like the the shaman or whatever he is. Uh, I can't remember what they officially call it. Like the witch doc, not the witch doctor. It's a terrible. Ne- the wise man, the seer. Yeah. Uh, so seer something. Yeah. So really nice. Um, you know, line of Viking and Anglo-Saxon and all those. You know, they do really good work. And now that you're adding in moderns, obviously, um, I'm very excited to see where the line goes. Uh, for people who, again who followed this podcast, they know that um, I, Tim, was kind enough to send me some Groms and um, send me an SOCR boat, which is a fantastic kit. Is that one still available, Tim? It is, and it's that. You know, I came out with that, what, two, three years ago, I think, possibly? Maybe say two. That is still today a very popular item. Uh, yeah, it, it's still available. Awesome. I, I, I recommend it to anybody. Um, my only criticism, and I, and you know what? You can speak to this because this is an actually an excellent point a lot of people uh, might want to hear about, is that the barrels and stuff on the 249s, uh, they're a little – I don't want to say fiddly, just soft. You know, they bend real easy, but right. they're very realistic scale. They're not overscaled. Uh, and some people might ask you why you why you chose that direction in casting and creation, um, because I've talked to other people. Uh, one specifically was I spoke to Ronnie Retton from Mantic. Uh, Ronnie and I are friends, and I spoke to John Paul Brigatti, who is the CEO of uh, Battlefront. Uh, we happen to be friends as well. And, uh, you know, they were talking about casting and, you know, why some of their stuff looks overscaled, especially weapons. And, um, you know, they say because of fragility and because of ease of detail. But you seem to go more towards the realistic end of uh, scaling on your weapons. What do you would you what is your point to that or what would you say counter to them? Well, I would say uh that's a big answer. Uh, at the time, I was looking at the the more realism, uh-huh. and I, I've seen other companies do the same thing, and I've had the same complaints as well about other companies' uh, barrels being too thin and stuff. At the time, the two forty nine, two forties, I thought it, I thought it was thick enough. Yeah, and you, so you just learn over the the ranges to definitely bulk up the the the, the weapon uh, the 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 main uh, part of the the, the rifle uh, as well as bulk up that rifle barrel two or three times the thickness mm-hmm. it you have to do that from a printing perspective as well as then because i, I we have envision tech printers here so uh from a printing perspective, so it survives the printing process, and then the printing process to a mold process is 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 different. It's 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 there is shrinkage involved. Uh, so uh, I just think of George Costanza, not from Seinfeld, but uh, shrinkage. I was in the pool, uh, but but um, that's that's what happens. And yeah. So then that was like, okay, well, crap. And I didn't really rec- I didn't even really notice the, that that. Um, uh, until it was too late, you know, and, to be, and then I thought, okay, well, you know, you, you can definitely correct it. You can fix it and, it, and, and move along. Um, but yeah, definitely over the years. And I've seen it with my own, the rifles that we produce, we've just definitely increased the thickness of those things. Mm-hmm. Uh, and people, some people say, oh my gosh, it's too thick. Well, you know what? Um, a lot of people don't understand the concepts of, of design versus production and to be able to mass produce things that that uh can withstand those fat fingers on the table (laughs) uh you need to bulk things up yeah and and, you know i don't want you to take it as severe criticism like i said i think they're 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 very nicely detailed um i just got frustrated because it's like when i was doing some assembly or painting i would brush against some of those barrels and they would bend i'm like dang it yeah you know and so um we're talking about metal right yeah yeah metal okay um i've seen i guess okay part of it is um i mean i don't cast any miniatures or anything like that but 
I've I buy I'm very I'm very disloyal. <laughs> I've I've said <laughs> when it comes to what uh, you know who I buy from whatever. I guess I'm a project driven guy, and it's okay. There's a project due in two weeks. What's available that Amazon gets me like yesterday? Sure. Um, so I buy like whatever is out there. So I've so for, for modern miniatures, I've done 28, 20, and 15s, and thick barrels and things like that are something I've definitely seen in 15s. You know, you almost don't notice. And, um, you know, you almost have to, a metal and in plastic. And uh, I did buy some Caesar miniatures for moderns. Uh-huh. They're all soft plastic. And That's the, right. The yeah. weapons are exactly correct. Mm-hmm. They're exactly correct. The problem is even in soft plastic, they don't break, but they bend. And they come out of the box bent because they use it in soft plastic. They don't bend when you touch them. They come out of the bag already bent. And um, I ruined a lot of them by trying to warm them up to the point where I could bend them where they were straight. And I wind up, uh, let's just say a lot of my M16s turned into M4 carbines. And a lot of my AKs <laughs> turned into uh, AKSU carbines really fast. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, and the I think we're painting a- is if, if you're going to make the barrel thick or, or the forward guard or whatever, you know, the, the forward furniture, I understand that. What gets me is some companies um, – they make the whole weapon big. They don't yes. just make the barrel thing. Yeah. And so my M16s look like, uh, you know, German anti-tank rifles. They're like eight feet long. No, and it's, right. that, that I don't like. That I don't like at all. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, there is a lot of design work and a lot of thought put out into creating miniatures. And you have to really think, how best is this model going to be represented? And how best is it going to survive fat fingers on the table? Mm -hmm. So, again, from my perspective, the, the weapons are all done digitally. And then they're printed. And then they're taken to metal casting. And that's how we... So, there's you just have to... I mean, there's been the HK416, for example, that we did. I mean, the amount of editing and work that we did the, from from the first start, probably six or seven times just to be able to get it right. Yeah. It is, it is a challenge. So I do see some people, like you said, they will take that, that miniature or that, that weapon and just bulk the whole thing up 30%, 40%. It will survive, but like you said, it looks like they're carrying a, a Barrett eighty-eight. Walking, <laughs> you know, and and the, so it is a you got to find a happy medium. Yeah. yeah one happy. last one, one last tiny point. Um, if if the designer is purist and says, okay, I'm going to build not not to talk trash about Caesar miniatures because they, they were first of all the price was right, but on top yeah, of, that, of course, when when you get done with the uh, assuming the barrel survives, I tried lighters that didn't work, then I tried warm water that finally worked a little bit. Once again, these are 20 millimeters, not 28 mils. Once you do get it painted, because usually the weapon is either black or a very dark gray, or if it's an AK, it's got that little bit of wooden furniture on the front, and then you put it on the table, you can't see it. Yeah. Right. It's yeah. gone. And now the guy's just standing there with like this, you know, shooting pose, and it's like he's holding an invisible weapon. Yeah. Um, yeah. So as far as bulking up the weapon goes, at least it's width. I'm not saying it's length, but it's right. width. I've, I've never. I've I've used way too many different companies. My my collection doesn't match at all. Um, but it, yeah, I would definitely uh, I definitely see why. I definitely agree with it. I think it's a you know smart decision. That being said, I'm not in you know the manufacturing side, so yeah, I don't really know what I'm talking about. Oh, believe me, it's 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 so funny because I look at something and like okay, that's really cool. Okay, how am I going to make that? Mm-hmm. How is it? How is this vehicle or this particular weapon going to actually survive the the production uh, of it? So there's it, it, there's it is a challenge, especially with, with even with poses. How do you pose a certain figure so that um, is that particular arm going to get buried into a mold or a leg? Is it going to get buried into the mold? And if we do that, then how long is that mold going to last? Is there going to be tearing? Uh, that sort of thing. So yeah. it um, that that's why people come to me and, and say, you know, hey, you know, I, I thought about getting into making some models and stuff, and I say, don't. <laughs> I says, you're be, be a civilian and just play. 
yeah. then then your hobby experience will be so much better <laughs> because they just don't they don't realize it's funny when i first started getting into 3d printing with fdm filament based printers mm-hmm. uh i had a farm of i had 12 printers wow and people are like, oh, my God, I'm going to buy a printer. I'm going to screw it. I'm going to make all this money. Well, there is a lot of work involved. Oh, and then yeah. You re- then you realize that your time is now being devoted to making miniatures for other people so that they can game. And that your time will not be for you. It will be so that others will. So that's why I'm very fortunate. <laughs> I have, you know, people that that uh, uh, that uh, work for me, that do the casting, that that does the design, in-house design. I, I'm very, very fortunate with that so that I can still have a hobby, you know, so I can still game. But it's, it's safer to be a civilian. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, 12 FDM printers. I'm like, I thought I was excessive with three. Oh, so, no, and no, it is yeah. a lot of work. You know, that's, you make a good point, Tim. People see, let's go, let's be honest. Majority of people these days, when they want to learn about something, where do they go to? YouTube. YouTube. Yeah. Right. So they see the 3D printer guy and Maker's Mark and, you know, those guys and, uh, you know, showing printing and they look at the, the amazing stuff they do. What they don't see is the hours and hours that were not filmed of adjustments and, you know, you know, fine adjustments in the in slicer program and and just the equipment adjustments to get a print to print right or the how many failures you know you oh. have oh. i oh, yeah. i uh big supporter of printable scenery um amazing printable terrain uh if you guys have not uh checked out any of their stuff if you're looking for fantasy stuff uh they have some really great 3d printable terrain and i've had prints that last like 30 hours and you're getting an hour 25 and it fails and it's frustrating to no get out because there's really not much recovery, you know, uh, and you don't sit there and stare at it for 30 hours. You know, you, you let it run, you come back, check on it, you know, so on and so on. And you get this nice big building and all of a sudden it just fails. It's so frustrating. So people don't understand there's a lot of work that goes into it. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and I remember and it, it, for people who are wanting to get into 3D printing, they ask me, which printer do I need to buy? And then the first thing I ask them is, well, how much do you have to yeah. spend? Uh, now, when I first got into printing, the the I, I told people you got to be at least get into this, you got to spend at least six thousand six hundred to a thousand dollars. Do not even waste your time with these two hundred dollar pieces of, of crap printers because you will one either go insane or two you will get a divorce because <laughs> all of your time will be spent trying to get that thing up and running. Now however times have changed and yeah. I have been told that the Ender threes is an amazing um, printer. Are amazing printers, yep. and I personally have thought about getting one um, because I I have now, as far as FDM printers, one. I have one. I sold all of them, and uh, I have one. It's a raised 3D printer and two. It's got a build of twelve by twelve by twelve. Oh, nice. So it's a, I think at the time a three or four thousand dollar printer, well worth the money. It's just three four thousand dollars. That's all it is. So, um, but the Ender three. Or under five, right? There's, either, I think the five is bigger than the three. For, for, from my understanding, it's two or three hundred dollars built, and uh, there is a very strong community out there for those printers. So I actually thought about getting one just to have running, yeah. You know, just for for printing the terrain that you just spoke of, like printable scenery and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, uh, you know. Uh, it's it's cool technology, uh, but definitely the resin is the way to go. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I just got a resin printer. I bought one of those little uh, photon, any cubic photon ones. Just yeah, you know, because I wasn't sure on the whole resin idea, so it seemed like a decent intro one. Um, I've been printing. What scale are those, Jim? Eight millimeter <laughs> uh, oh, wow. M ones. Um, oh right. You know, and they've been coming uh, out really nice. Were those eights or sixes? Were those eights or sixes? I think I, I there. I, the original file is eight, and I was going to drop them down to six. Is that you wanted them six or ten? Because I, I was going to print you a whole company of M ones. So. Oh gosh. Um. Wow. Uh, for which project? I don't know. Whatever you need. <laughs> Remember, I was gonna. Okay. You were going to work on a project, and I said I will print you whatever you need. So. Um, uh, was it? Uh, 15 mil? Uh, I've already you were going to do the uh, Marines. Already got a, 
Yeah, I've, I've already bought all that. Okay. Um, but we can talk about that in a later yep, part yep. of the show. So, um, you know, Tim, I want to circle back on something. There, um, in OTT, on Tabletop, or formerly known as Beast of War, uh, they had a, a session on um, is metal the best medium oh, yes. for miniatures right and of course that started a firestorm because there's a lot of people say ah metal's antiquated and you know plastic's the way to go and if you want to customize anything yada 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 and i know you your stuff is done in metal and some of your vehicles and stuff is resin um what are the pluses or minuses from your viewpoint on metal versus plastic so this is a personal conversation. Uh-huh. This is a case to, uh, from a gamer who's been gaming since he was four uh, and a painter. I personally like from for figures metal. Why so? Because, why so? Because I can speed paint a lot quicker. Because, here's a good example. I was painting some of my pulp figures. I did 80s pulp figures. And they were, we also do spin, resin spin casting. Mm-hmm. So I, uh, when I first made them, I, I did them in resin. And the resin's great. The detail's awesome. The gun barrels, even at thick guns, you can still kind of get that little bend. So here I am. I am speed painting my figure. I take a hair dryer, whoo, put it on there to dry, and all of a sudden the whole damn thing's bending. I'm like, <laughs> oh my gosh, I forgot about that. So then I had to wait to let it cool off and, and things like that. So I found personally for me, with the resin figures, I cannot paint as fast because my style is different. You know, I, I paint, I do my best to paint pretty fast and use my trusty $10 hair dryer. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I also, there is no weight there. I prefer a, a game piece that's going to have some weight that's sure. not. And also, the, the 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 reason why I do metal is it's predicated based on what the consumer is wanting. Especially I found in the United States, gamers are wanting figures in metal. Really? I wouldn't have known that. Um, no. I, I, would, I would say uh, plastic is easier to work with. But once it's done, I wish everything was metal. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I would agree with that. Metal, it just feels better when you're picking it up and moving it around the table or whatever. Um, I, I'm not a big fan of having to work with metal. Um, sometimes it's tough for me to get primer to stick to the metal. Maybe I'm just not using the right primer. Oh, okay. um, but, uh, yeah, almost – I don't want to start an argument, but uh, never resin. I'll stick with either plastic or metal. They both have their pluses and minuses. Never resin. Resin, Which it's, it's, it doesn't oh. have, it doesn't, it doesn't have, it doesn't have the e. It's not as easy to work with as plastic, and uh, it does. It's not as sturdy as metal. Once it's done, it's still very shatter um, uh, vulnerable. It's vulnerable to be shattered, chipped, broken. You drop it, it breaks or whatever. Uh, I, I would, I would either stick with metal. Mm. I'm sorry, yeah, either metal or plastic. That said, once everything is done, I wish everything was. I think I wish everything was metal. I need to. Invent the magic wand allows me to turn all my plastic ma- miniatures <laughs> into, into metal. Um, so some alchemy going there. But uh, yeah, the finished product, yeah, I would go with metal. So, Tim, what primer do you use? I'm sorry, what was the question? What primer do you use um, on your I use, I use. I'm not a big miniatures guy, so I use whatever's yeah. at the hobby store. All right. Or uh, the craft store. So um, Krylon works well for me. Either light gray, depending on what I'm painting. Usually light gray for uh, uh, light gray for figures and black for uh, vehicles. So I found the Army Painter primers, and I've just done some metals in Zandri dust uh-huh. um, for a base to do some camo on top of. Because um, someone on one of the lists posted up his paint jobs for the White Dragon miniatures. Yeah, that yeah, was nice. The yeah. Brits. Um, so I'm using that for my SAS. Um, so I got a bunch of the paints and I found the Zandri dust went on really well onto the metals, but I also found the army paint are greys and blacks go on really well as well. So I would recommend them for from a spray can anyway if you can get them. Yeah. Tim, what do you um, uh, recommend for priming metals? Um, I, I have an airbrush, uh-huh. so I airbrush all my stuff, especially, yeah. I, I, you, know, you know, G, you will definitely understand this. Um, not so much James since he lives in Florida. Yeah, it's getting cold. And uh, <laughs> a lot of people will will say, I can't prime my miniatures because it's too cold outside. Uh, 
What's great about having an airbrush is that you can use, I personally use Badger, Stylize. That's what I use, yeah. I use primer. Badger, but not for primer. I mean, can you put, I guess, I'm showing my ignorance here. No. Can you put a primer through an airbrush? That's not going to come up. Yeah. Yes, sir. So okay. uh, the Badger, I, and I am not sponsored by Badger, I whatever. So I, You're preaching to the choir because everyone, yeah, okay, everyone in here has a Badger. People, you know, guys, you know, I, so I, I've i been using an airbrush for several years. The great thing about airbrushes is that it gives you the ability to prime inside. Mm-hmm. It also gives you to do, I do Zenithal type of uh, priming. And you, yes, you can do that with rattle cans, but I, it's different. It's a different experience. You have more control with an airbrush. The paint's not as thin thick as a spray can uh, so yes i use badger style res res on both metal and resin i also use vallejo primer however i have found that the badger primer personally is is better than the vallejo and for people who ask me what kind of airbrush i have uh, i have badger patriots yes uh, I have nice a pa- patriot 105s i have badger patriot xls i have badger sotars uh, I, I used to have a Micron, oh, yeah, custom CMB. I think it was a four or five hundred dollar airbrush, and every time I used a damn thing, something always broke. And it was always <laughs> it was like the the main part of the 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 twice I had to replace the main core valve. I think it was one hundred and twenty dollars uh, for the for the part. Jeez. So. Highly recommend Badger. I have just recently ordered AK Interactive's uh, airbrush, and I think retail is like sixty dollars for it. Really? So uh, I'll let you know how it is. I'm gonna. My idea with it is to use it mainly for priming uh-huh. and uh, and also coating, seal, yeah. sealing, you know, that sort of thing. But that's what I use. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I paint with the. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was gonna say, um, I'm right there with you, Tim. You know. I, I don't know if you jumped in on his 55th uh, birthday sale. Um, they, they had uh, about this time last year, they started it, and I picked up two new um, Badger airbrushes. And I've always used, well, I shouldn't say always, but since, you know, several years ago when we I met him at Adepticon, uh, you know, I got some sample bottles of the Style and Eyes primer. That's all I use. And yeah. I, I actually had an Iwata that mm-hmm. I now use as my priming airbrush because it has a bigger uh, well. Mm -hmm. a bigger cup so that one i will use for my primer and then the two badgers i will use for you know actual detail work or you know getting in there for the finer work but i really like the badger and the nice thing is he's local to me uh he's literally 45 minutes down the road from me so you know if i needed anything i could call them up say hey i need this and if i really needed it i could probably convince them to let me just come pick it up um so no, they're good quality airbrushes, and they're not extremely expensive. Um, no, no. So, Badgers? No, yeah. my Badger costs less than Tim's component. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, <laughs> and, and you know what? And, and that was my – when I – because I, I – I messaged Ken and spoke to Ken, the owner of Badger, yep. and I called him. And I said, Ken, I have an Iwata Custom CMB. It's a $600 airbrush or whatever the cost was, just two crazy costs. I says, now I see that you make a SOTAR that, that says that you could do a line as thin as an eyelash. How the heck is that? And how are you selling it for a hundred and some odd dollars? Uh-huh. You know, and so it was a very good conversation. Uh, and I've never looked back. So I use, I have a couple of the SOTARs and they're great for like very fine, thin detail work. Uh, you will find airbrush artists, not guys airbrushing t-shirts, but you know, true artists, shall we say? <laughs> yes. Uh, who use that SOTAR and my God, the, yeah. the, the thin lines you could, it's amazing. And, and I think a Patriot, you can get on Amazon for seventy bucks, yeah. I, I, something like that. If people come to me to, to buy. They say, oh, "I want to buy airbrushes from you." I says, "You know what? You can do, get it cheaper on Amazon." Uh, so, yeah, I highly recommend it. Yeah, yeah. I have a, I have a badge around here. It cost me about a hundred dollars, hundred and twenty dollars. Yes, yeah. yeah they're the, only, the only somewhat thing, at least for me, is um, a good, then of course the, the compressor costs like a hundred yes. bucks or whatever. And then yep. something happened. I, I wound up, I lost my uh, the hose, got a, got a break in it or something. 
the people that are available locally that I can just buy stuff from, they sell exclusively Iwata. So I wind up having to buy an adapter anyway um, to connect, you know, the Iwata hose to my Badger airbrush or whatever. My, yeah. So I should probably just buy all my stuff from Badger anyway. The little bit of money and time I save, I have to go online and buy something heavy shipped anyway. But um, yeah, that's the only thing. I, I paint with brushes, uh, airbrushes all the time. Uh, I just was, I'm always either didn't hear of it or if I did hear about it, I kind of rejected it. The idea of putting primer through a, um, through an airbrush. Cause I'm always have that nightmare of, you know, it's going to clog up your valves. It's going to, you know, <laughs> cause uh, I've been always under the impression that primer was, was thicker than maybe it shouldn't be primer. Should well, be it, thicker than, than paint or it is thicker. I don't know the chemistry behind the primer, uh, the, the difference between the primer versus their paint or regular airbrush paint. But I know I, I don't have to dilute it at all. I, yeah. I take the, shake the bottle, pour it right into the cup. I'm shooting at about 35 to 40 PSI. Yep. And now I will say with with using the primer or any primer, I always highly recommend everyone getting an ultrasonic cleaner uh, for for airbrushes. You can get those on Amazon for twenty, thirty dollars. And so after I'm done priming, I do take I do take the gun down and I do throw it in the ultrasonic cleaner just to get rid of a lot of that gunk because it is primer you yeah. know it's yeah. so that's what i do i have a ritual that the, the so when i i'm looking at napoleonic artillery pieces right in front of me uh so i've got like 12 of them here so i will just take a whole bunch of group and then i'll just get my idea out of how what do i need to prime and what colors and stuff like that and i do that and i i take the, the airbrush apart and throw it right in the ultrasonic cleaner yeah so uh, let's change gears here and let's talk some more about foot sore. So you, you, you're you bringing your modern group to foot sore because they didn't have moderns per se. They were more Correct. into the historical pre all electrical age. Um, <laughs> dark ages. Dark ages. Dark ages. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so they they did they take gangs of Rome? So they have gangs of Rome, oh, yes. right? Yes. Oh, yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And um, – are the, and now, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't they take um, oh test of honor too from back from Warlord or how is that working? So, so Andy Hobde uh -huh. and um, oh my gosh, uh, just left me. Graham Davies, yes, Graham. created uh, test of honor, and they had that under Warlord, uh -huh. and then they decided to to leave, and they own test of honor and now Graham produces Tess of Honor 2 and Footsore over in the UK produces the miniatures mm -hmm. for Test of Honor then I'm also the US distributor for Test of Honor 2 so that's how that goes gotcha okay so modern wise so all your lines that used to be under SASM are now available through Footsore or are you still migrating over. So we are st we are still migrating. I know for a fact they have six or seven different packs there that they are going to or either they're doing it now or in the process of uh -huh. uh, creating molds to then sell all the uh, special arts and service figures, all the footsore modern figures over in the UK. Uh -huh. And so they'll be servicing the European customers. I, I found that a lot of European customers wanted the ranges, but they didn't want to pay uh, the shipping, uh, as well as the customs. Sure. Which, as a Yank, I find funny because that's what I've been doing for a very, very, very long time. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So, uh, but you have to provide the product. Yeah. And the whole idea behind this is to provide a, to create a really great product that helps people have fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so uh, why not have that uh, opportunity to to have it produced and sold there so that's Excellent. that was that is what is happening so for, so any ranges so those that are uh over in the uk right now um uh, what would you say what are the ranges that are currently available are, are your ranges available here in the u.s side all of them or are you limited to whatever the other side is as well all of the ranges are available now in, the, in North America, in the United States. Okay. They the uh, footsore footsore over in the UK. I know have the Task Force Raptor figures. Uh huh. 
they have the new Urban SAS figures. They have Boko Haram. Uh, they have the, I believe, the Conflict Ukraine ranges. I believe they also have the SEALs. I cannot, I, th- I can't remember, but I think that's what they have. So okay. I know that they're in the process of making the molds and stuff. Uh, and I know they've just been a little busy with Mortal Gods and the Dark Ages ranges and we have uh, Mortal Gods Mythic coming out. So they've been a little bit little busy there, but they have the figures. Gotcha. So, that's awesome. So um, Chris, unfortunately, couldn't join us because he has to pay his bills and has to work today. But <laughs> I've been talking to him via messenger and he has a question for you, Tim. And let me pull it up here. He goes, um, he would like to know any info about the rumor of a possible rule set for modern coming out from you guys. Do you want to so let rule, us know about that? Sure. Yeah, I'd love to talk about it. the rule set. So, I have I've, a lot of people have asked me about rules, and they asked me when I created the figures, which was very funny to me. The miniatures, I'd create this, you know the the miniatures, and they said, "Well, what what games can I play those with?" And it took me aback. As well, these these are these are rules agnostic. Yeah, you you could use them for any of the rules uh, that, and I was uh, partial to Force on Force since I did a lot of work with Sean Carpenter uh, uh, in in for Force on Force. Uh, you use Skirmish Sangin, you can use them for Spectre. It it, it it doesn't matter. It's just all it's all rules agnostic. However, I found that people kept wanting new rules because they're not happy with the rules that are currently available today. Mm-hmm. Which is interesting to me. I mean, I even says, guys, you can play modern bolt action. That's a free download. I mean, that's even a great set of rules. So I, I was starting to write my own set of rules, and I realized that my time, I just could not split it between the miniature side and then writing the rules and then painting and the social media. So I sought out companies that already had a set of rules. Uh-huh. And the one that, that I fell in love with is Fistful of Lead by Wiley Games. Okay. Jay Wiley is the creator of Fistful of Lead, and there's other supplements and other books that he makes, like Galactic Heroes and, and, and horror books and stuff like that. It's all around 28 millimeter skirmish gaming. We are working on a couple other supplements together now that will be released next year, uh, especially far modern and, and 80s pulp gaming and stuff like that. So Fistful of Lead, it's out. It's out now. It's available on the on Footstore Miniatures, uh, on, on uh, footstorenorthamerica.com. So it, it's it's there. It's a great skirmish game. I mean, it's everything. I think people ask me, well, with a set of rules, are you going to use different ballistics and weapons different? No. I, I No. I... I I personally feel that uh, with with the more uh, involved with the rules and the more quote realistic you make them, uh-huh. that creates more opportunities for uh, a lot of conversation and arguing. <laughs> and this one is better than this. And this study says no. In the end, we're wanting to play games, uh, and some people are wanting to play games under an hour or two. Yeah, the fistful of lead um, provides that opportunity. So, um, Tim, can you kind of take us through what makes Fistful of Lead stand out from other rule sets that are currently available in Moderns? So I can only speak from a perspective of the modern rules that I personally own. Okay. And what I preferred about uh, uh, Fistful of Lead is it's not it's not a you-go-I-go. It's a card-driven game. So that you, you, it's not something that you can just sit back and and, and uh, you you did your turn and now my opponent's doing. It. So it's it's you, there's a lot of reaction mm-hmm. uh, to the opponent that can that you know that what the opponent is doing. The other thing what I liked about the set of rules was the feel, the energy behind the company itself. Okay, and uh, and just the, the I know the person that, that's written them. So he lives in the three hours away from me gotcha. in Independence, Missouri. Okay. So I can't, I can't speak to, I've got, you know, upstairs I have Skirmish Sang and I've got, of course, all the Force from Force stuff. Uh, and what I liked about uh, the, 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 what I heard a lot from the other modern rules that are out there today is that it was kind of like a lot of them were like chess games. You spent all this time maneuvering, situating, 
to get to your your miniature to one place to the other, and no one really died. Mm. I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know. I don't have personally that experience. What I do know is that uh, it, it doesn't have a very difficult reaction system. It's it's all car driven, and uh, it it just provides it's an ease of play. The other thing is that I've seen ten guys play this game with this full lead. No, oh, really. So when you're at conventions, uh, or like here, my 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 house is Gaming Central, so for historical gaming and, and other gaming, so when I can have ten to fifteen people here, uh, that is uh, <laughs> that's awesome when you when you can actually run a, a nice size modern game with that amount of people. Yeah, a lot of the games now are written for two for two players, mm-hmm. which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you have a, a, a group that you know, a, a gaming group that's you know six to eight guys, uh, then that's why I found Fistful of Lead provides that so that you can have that many players. Gotcha. Okay, awesome. Um, so, does the rule set uh, allow for vehicle use, or is it just mainly infantry? vehicles as well okay uh and yep and then we're also with the other modern supplement that we're working on we'll have more vehicles than there is okay is this more formalized military or is there like uh, militias and pmcs and things like that as well so the way fistful of lead is you can create your own team okay that's the other thing what i liked about it is that you can create your own team you can have them as militia you can have as pmcs a little partial to the pmc uh and you just you stat them out and then you just you just play so the 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 modern supplement will have some canned groups for militias and, and pmcs and stuff like that excellent you know you're only four hours away from me there. Yeah, you know we should. I get... was just gonna say I'm. Uh, <laughs> I'm already looking for uh, flight rates to St. Louis. He just said his house was Gaming Central. So, and it's well, if, all right, so let me, uh, Tim. I'm gonna kind of uh, disclose something here. So Tim and I are friends on Facebook, and Tim posts occasionally images of some of the stuff he's working on for game tables and you know play day events and stuff he does. I'm like. You know, let me see if I don't get the line 100% correct please do not flog me but from the line from Batman when the Joker says where does he get all those cool toys <laughs> well okay so uh, I am very fortunate I have a 6 by 12 table here uh, and this is where I work out of yeah. this is what, when, when you guys are seeing social media posts this is my office this is what I do uh, yeah. This is all I do. I, I've been. I, I talked about my father got me into gaming when I was four. He was playing with plastic airfix and NPC figures. He got me into my first board game was Tactics Two. Yes. And, yes. So Panzer Classic. Leader. Yes, I love that game. Fifty four Avalon Hill. Yeah. Uh, Panzer first Leader. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. Two. That's right. Oh, uh, Panzer Leader, Panzer Blitz. No. All of that. Yeah, all Jim, of that. Jim, we stuff. got another one to come play with no. us, huh? No. Oh, you don't like Panzer Leader? Oh, no, he I, loves. I, I don't like Panzer Leader. Oh, he loves Panzer Leader. Oh, okay. You need to check so, out some of our weekend I, I, games. I was, I, was, I was raised in it. So this is all I do. I'm not a sports guy. I am, I am a geek that... Uh, is very lucky. I still don't understand how. I'm married to a very attractive, beautiful woman who supports me. <laughs> and I, I, I just, I just, in the end, it is about playing and having fun yeah. and bring joy and happiness to the gaming table, helping inspire people to, to paint and to build and just to have fun. So, you Tim, know? would you be so, interested in doing some uh, Fistful of Lead videos when you're ready? Yes. Featuring your minis and your table? Yes. Yep. yep. All yep. right. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I, I'm, yep. I'm, I'm set up for uh, – I've got multiple cameras here that I could do live streaming. Excellent. And all that sort of stuff. Oh, that, that's that's what's fun. I, I yeah. love doing it. You so know, uh, it. we could have a little joint effort here between the Sit Rep podcast and Foot Sore and all that good stuff. I would love it. Yeah. I mean, I, I as, as you know, you're an American group. Well, most of you are at least here. Uh, <laughs> I would have no problem with sponsoring the, the, the podcast as well. Excellent. So I can tell you that Ralph is American by marriage right ralph 
Yes. <laughs> you know, I, I, I will say I was I was physically born here in the United States, but when I am in London and England, that's where my true home is. There you go. You uh, know, I love it. I, I oh, Don and I were just talking the other day, and I was like, you know, man, we really got to get back to salute. I mean, because that truly is our Adepticon is always going to be our home convention. You know, because obviously it's it's. 40 minutes from my house and it is you know we're involved in it in you know many ways but salute to me is where i go to see all my gaming friends from the atlantic side and it's just an amazing show and i don't know if you've ever been to it tim but if you have not you have to go it is i know i I haven't jay wiley's going uh, for in 2020, yeah. and I, I'm glad you brought up about Adepticon, and and I wanted to also address a lot of other things. Yeah, people have asked me, uh, Tim, are you going to go to Fall In? Are you going to go to Command Con? Or not Command Con? Uh, oh, what the uh, Historicon? Historicon. Yes. Um, my, I was just at a show a couple weeks ago here, and well, it was about three hours from St. Louis called Recruits. It is a great gaming convention that's held in, in Lee Summit High School. They've got five to six hundred attendees. I was, and, and that's a, it's a smaller con. You cannot compare it to Adepticon mm-hmm. by all means. However, I found that I'm sit, standing here behind the table selling my wares, meeting people, having great relationships. It was great. But it's like, wait a minute, I'm not playing. Yeah. And I also found I don't like sitting. <laughs> and, and so when people keep asking me, are you going to go to these cons? I don't, it's not something I prefer to do because I don't want to sit behind a table all day. I want to roam and play. And and, yeah. and so that is a challenge because I'm being asked, are you going to Adepticon uh, in 2020? I don't know yet because I honestly do not want to sit behind a table all day. I want to be able to walk around and shake hands and and hug people and have fun and, and, and play. So, yeah. But, uh, it, you know, it's good for business. I, I mean, that's I, how I used to talk to Bill all the time is when, you know, I went to yep. the table. So... Mm-hmm. For foot okay. sore. Um, mm-hmm. One quick uh, recommendation. Um, I'm not trying to pressure you or anything, but um, we recently did on tabletop coverage for Historicon, and uh, I felt the same way. I mean, I wasn't sitting behind a table. In fact, I was exactly the opposite. Uh, Justin had Jerry and I out there with a camera doing, you know, sweeping clears. I mean, I think I went through five pairs of shoes. Um, <laughs> You know, just literally get more content, get more content, get more. This is rendered and posted, get more content. Mm-hmm. And we're, we're photographing all these tables and we're taking, we're interviewing the people who are running the games, we're interviewing the people, we're interviewing the people who are um, playing the games. And of course, we always kind of end the conversation, you know, the little video interviews with, looks like you guys are having a lot of fun, you know, grind the teeth, grind the teeth. <laughs> looks like you guys are having a lot of fun. God damn it. You know, <laughs> <laughs> looks like you guys are having a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> But um, the good thing about Historicon is that all the vendor stuff shuts down at like five, maybe six. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We shut down our media content at like four or five, and those okay. games run till past midnight. So okay. even if you are there on the clock, you're wearing a t-shirt, you're wearing a badge, you're working, yeah. um, you ha- you still have time to participate. I was in okay. uh, First Freeman's Farm uh, with a great a great couple of guys. Oh my god, these guys were so much fun. If you guys ever listen to us. Um, Marvin and uh, Jamie Veter up there in upstate New York. You guys ran like the best Saratoga game I've ever played. In. Oh, wow. I've played in a lot of Saratoga games. I've literally written books on Saratoga and uh, this was amazing. So it's, it's a big con. It's not terribly merchandise focused. There is a definitely a merchandise element to it, but um, after that, you know, everything shuts down at a certain time and they're pretty strict about it too. Um, but then the games continue to run long after that. So I, even if you are there in a work capacity, in a business sense, you know, you still have a lot of time to have fun. And, okay. uh, you'll meet people and have games, chuck dice. That's and a lot of the know. tables there are like group participation games. It's, it really is a great environment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that's good to know. I, I, I'm definitely not a, uh, against it. I just have, I have to do a lot of internal convincing. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 the, the more, we talk the more we sound extremely similar i mean we even like some of the same game panzer leader my god oh god yeah. um yeah. uh but I, I you know they were trying to get me to go to historicon and i was like i don't want to go and then g was gonna go and i was like okay now i want to go and then right something came up with g's life she wasn't able to go i'm like well shit now i have to quit because i you know i don't want to con I don't, i'm not a con guy you know um but i have heard that historicon is a little oh, unusual yeah. in a good way in this regard mm-hmm. in that you know it's 
a lot more, you know, community focused. There's more tables that people can play at or whatever. It's like that's probably two thirds of the con is community participation games, as opposed to some other cons. I've never been there, but from what I've heard, cons like Salute, where it's pretty much a table where people are selling things. You know, a yeah. lot of a lot of tables and a lot of people. And the whole idea that the that the con runs one day, yeah, for Salute drives me crazy. There's no way you're getting within 100 miles of a, of a Salute con, you know, but. Historicon goes four days, and right. a lot of those games, those all of those tables run all four nights. Some of them run two nights, some of them run three nights. So if you miss it the first night, there's a, a table you really want to get to. Yeah, I mean, if, if you like to play, I mean, Historicon is definitely. Uh, and I've I've heard that it's a little unusual in that regard. That other cons don't quite take that approach. And it's one of the things that people who were at Historicon, obviously it's a biased crowd, but people who were at Historicon were like, this is why we come to Historicon because it's better than other cons in these ways. You know, probably not better overall. You know, different cons have different you know objectives or whatever, but Historica has a certain thing that it goes for, and I think it does that really well. Yeah. Um, next year, the plan is to have as much of the Sit Rep podcast team at Historicon and to be live streaming from there as much as possible. That is that is the plan for next year. Um, I've already put it in my calendar for vacation time, so uh, – Jim made me extremely jealous that I had to back out at the last minute due to some family commitments. But, oh, I tell you what, it, that is the convention for t- that scratches my particular itch for historical stuff. You know, Gen Con's great, but it's so big you get lost in it. And there's just so much stuff that I'm not interested in, but it's nice to be exposed to it. And then his uh, Adepticon obviously is, you know, miniatures heavy. Obviously, that's what it's created for. But a lot of it's still 40K and Age of Sigmar and that kind of stuff, which – uh, I'm not really big into that, you know. Sorry, Warren, Lloyd, everybody over in Ireland, but you know, if it was a Lord of the Rings convention, all the time, I'd be all over that one. But, <laughs> oh, that's uh, right. Yep. You know, so, uh, but there, you know, definitely moderns are coming and other gaming. So there's a lot, but Historicon, it's all history. To which Don goes, you can go. I don't care. Yeah. I'll sit in the office, and you know, uh, she has no no interest at all in that genre but um so we're definitely going to make plans on uh, doing that next year we got to see if we can get ralph and chris to come over so um we've but, already we've already objectively proved that dawn is in fact a modern gamer and we already we're that's right up. so because <laughs> harry potter takes place in the modern time that's that true could you not just wave dust as well and say hmm. yeah <laughs> <laughs> some dust players you know yeah. so uh you, yeah look, you call it you call it a fireball, all called an artillery strike. There you go. Happy, right? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we are definitely, Tim, we're going to have to do some stuff for uh, Fistful of Lead and uh, do some, you know, videos and stuff. I think that would be a great thing. And maybe we can even do a podcast from, you know, your table. So that, that would, would be, be awesome. Um, I would love it. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a question for you. In the news recently, everybody's probably seen it. Um, a uh, U.S. special operations team. Uh, I believe it was Delta, mm-hmm. uh, took out the main bad guy for uh, the ISIS. Uh, What's his name? El Baghdadi or something El like Bagdad, that? Yeah. Uh, El Baghdadi, uh, yeah. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about his name, El Baghdadi. I thought he was a rapper, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but my understanding is that the fur missile, in this case, a Belgian, was it a Belgian Malinois, mm-hmm. uh, basically yeah. took him out to the point where he panicked, unfortunately, being the selfish excuse my language, here's a warning, prick that he is, uh, blew himself up with three of his kids. Um, you know, and the, and the dog sustained some minor injuries and thankfully he's back on duty. Mm-hmm. So my question yeah. to you, Tim, are we going to see a miniature of it? <laughs> of Conan? What a name I, I, for a dog, Conan. So, yes. Ah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. Yep. You have to. You yeah. have to Very do those hungry. things. And, 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 and I'm, I'm glad you brought something up here. Uh, one of the things that I really enjoyed doing when I first started the the miniatures was that I, I took, you know, you open up the paper or you you open up Drudge or, or, or some sort of news source and you see what's going on outside your walls. That's instant inspiration to turn that into gaming. Now, there are some people that feel that that's too insensitive and I can't believe you do this and this and that. Oh, my God. I caught a lot of flack for doing the SES Hero. Uh, oh, from Africa? A lot of flack. Yeah. Oh, come on. That was no, like no, the no, biggest no. kick-ass thing ever. I'm not kidding you. 
I caught a lot of flack from this. People well, were like, that single miniature of the guy yeah. a hero. saving all those people. Yeah. A, a, a bloody hero. So first of all, people are saying, oh, you're too insensitive. A kid's too soon. First of all, wait a minute. We are playing with toy soldiers that represent killing each other by a throwing of a dice. If that is not insensitive enough, then I'm sorry. Maybe you're too sensitive. Uh, I'm sorry, but that entire argument strikes me as weapons grade hypocrisy. Well, well, no, no. Listen, is oh, it's too soon. You can't play moderns, or I'm not going to play with you because you play moderns, or whatever, whatever, whatever. Like, okay, so apparently there's a statute of limitations on human suffering. No, no. People died or cut themselves to bits or were blown into whatever in 1945 or 1918 or 18. 63 that's okay because they don't count anymore well so now to some people um i i know i i was a contractor in 04 and 05 in iraq and and some people who were in that conflict or still are in that conflict will say it's too soon for me i you know what brother sister i completely understand and no worries however you don't you don't hear that from those people though yeah well I have I heard, heard from social justice warriors. And, uh, well, you know. yeah. Well, but there's also, like you said, there is also a hypocrisy of, of people trying to take me down and all that sort of crap. It's ridiculous. However, that being said, it's the perfect – one of the coolest examples I remember was the day after – Osama bin Laden's compound was raided. Alan Rockwell of Gamecraft Miniatures, the day after, made the compound in six millimeter. It was the coolest thing he'd ever did at that particular time. And he's made a lot of cool things since then. But it was like, you know what? You got it there, Alan. You you definitely understand what we're doing. All we're doing is playing. We're not we're just creating the, the world on our table and having great scenarios and, and that's it. That's, you know, that's what we do. So now I will say this, um, I won't say this about any, uh, you know, creators, designers, people who build rule sets, make miniatures or whatever, publish games, but sometimes players, like individual groups, I'm not going to talk trash about how anyone, how anyone decides to approach or play a game. I mean, that's not, that's not my place at all, right. but sometimes people who will take a, uh, Normandy, um, you know, uh, dog green sector, you know, uh, you know, where like a company 116th of RCT was wiped out 95% in the first five minutes or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, you take that kind of a game and you're playing it very beer and pretzel style, you know, Oh, look, that boat got wiped out. Hot laugh, you know, swipe the miniatures off the table. That's a little weird. And maybe that's where some of that comes from, but I don't think that's how anyone I don't want to speak for everyone, like the whole industry, but it's been my experience. People I've talked to in the industry, myself, when I create product or whatever, uh, games, content or whatever, when we're doing something in any uh, time period, especially moderns, we're not approaching it like that. No. And uh, what really gets under my skin is sometimes when people come at us as a sub community or whatever, with that kind of attitude, it's almost like they're implying that we're, um, you know, very, you know, being very, you know, flagrant or flippant about it or whatever. Oh, look, this guy just got, you know, top of his head blown off. Hey, <laughs> you know, dude, it's not like that. No, and not at all. you're not at our table, so you wouldn't be saying that or you yeah. would know better. But yeah. I don't know. It's, I have uh, in the community a couple, uh, first of all, most of us here are veterans. Mm-hmm. And but most of the people that I game with are veterans. Um, in the UK, in the US, Canada, I've got you know veteran friends all over the place. Um, they're actually most of my gamers or whatever, and we never approach any kind of gaming like that. Even when we're playing like something silly like Dark Star, 26th century, uh, you know, way out in the future of starships or whatever, there's still like crew casualties, and you know, oh, this ship has to break off because it's just it's still functional, but it's just taking too many losses, too many people are you know wounded or down in med bay doesn't matter the game it's still people like you were saying a second ago, and you're right on the money it's still people that you're imagining you're st- i mean war games you are fantasizing about the mass killing of people if that doesn't square with you then i hate to say this might not be the hobby that you know you might be terribly comfortable in um I know there are sports games out there, uh, like you know Blood Bowl, where or, 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 even in Blood, even in those kind of games, people do get hurt and killed, right? Like those. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So never mind. That just invalidated my own argument. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, this this. So there are a couple of veteran friends I have. I won't mention them by name, but there's like two or three of them out there that I know. 
um, served uh, in some of the same, you know, some of the same time periods I was I was in for, and I was like, okay, he's not comfortable with it. But even when they say something, they are never coming at me with any kind of a um, oh. intent, with any kind of an agenda. Mm-hmm. You know, I literally invite them. I run these games every weekend or whatever. I invite them to. I just sent like this mass email blast, and they'll like quietly email me on the side, like, "Look, I love to play with your games. Let me know when you're running something World War II or something." I, I just, you know, I, we do go, we do Panzer Leader. Speaking mm-hmm. of Panzer Leader, Panzer Leader in uh, the Gulf War, 1991. Well, two of these guys were in the Gulf War. You know, and they're like, yeah, eh, eh. I said, okay, you know what, guys, I totally get it because, you know, you were there. Um, so that's different. And even then they do it on the quiet. They do it on the side and they're doing it from a personal level. They're not like on social media, you know, email blasting people all over the place saying, hey, guys, this isn't cool. You know, what are you doing um, You know, with this whole like kind of an agenda? It's the agenda that kind of bugs me. And. I know I'm talking too much about it, but it's it's always been kind of a raw nerve with me. Mm-hmm. When people try and tell other people what kind of games they either should or shouldn't play. That that, that gets under my skin. Yep. Yeah, it's just one of those things. Play your game. I'll play mine. I'm not forcing yeah. mine on you. You know, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. It's a game. You know, the word is in the title. Game. <laughs> it's a game. Right. You know, it's it's like the same argument with TV. Well, that TV show is inappropriate. So change the bloody channel. Don't watch it. You know, for the love of God, people. It's not like there's not enough channels out there. Exactly. Don't play it. You know, it's like the guy who burned his age. Oh, was it uh, War, uh, Warhammer Fantasy Army yeah. when they changed the Aegis? Why would you do something like that, you dumbass? Yeah. You know, he burned his all that money. What? what a yeah. waste of money. There was a guy when, when, when GW when, decided yeah, to change, yeah. uh, blew up, basically destroyed the old world, uh, a fantasy Job Warhammer, Warhammer fantasy. and became oh, the Age Sigmar and changed everything at the point in time because, you know, your old army wasn't going to be play- playable anymore. This is when it first came out. He, in protest, he took his beautifully painted army, went out in his backyard, threw it in a pile, I don't know, lighter fluid or charcoal, whatever it was, and lit it on fire in protest. To which I just looked at him and go, you're a dumbass. So that's, that's, that's the wrong kind of protest. Man. Yeah. Who are you hurting? GW's going, fine, you're just going to buy more anyway. So, you know. Oh. Anyway. So, uh, Ralph, what do you got going on in the news? Anything newsworthy for us today? Um, there's been nothing other than 18th of October, 19th of October, Battlefront put up the pre-orders for North Tag. Um, that was PSC. Ted, 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 PSC. Well, yeah, right. that was the, the thing. PS is done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I I, or, I ordered the starter. Done. So yes, yeah, so did I. Oh, I cannot <laughs> wait. So for the price as well. Yeah. I mean, you look at what you're getting. It's a good um, price. It was it was a good price for a lot yeah. of miniatures. Yeah. A lot of miniatures, and then they had the tags on as well because I noticed as well, which which was really interesting, is T80s. Yeah, there was a set. There was a set of T eighties as well. Yeah. So uh, yeah, after having tears on, shockingly, shockingly hard tank to find. So Jim, we definitely need to get you up here to Chicago to the home studio, and let's do a weekend, and we can you know run through some of these games. Um, I would like you to take me through a game of Dark Star. You know, um, we should have a good old fashioned Panzer Leader, Panzer Blitz, whatever. You know, day, um, but you know we need to start play testing some of the these games. Oh, gee, there was something else as well that was in well, it was last week or the week before. Spectre released the terrain stuff. They released the Herbesco. The Herbesco, um, yeah, terrain, yeah. It got released as well. Um, I think that's really it of any releases. Tim, There's don't you have uh, Herbesco uh, barricades as well? Yes, I do. Okay. Yep. Yep. Tim, just a quick question as well, is because I know you're doing the miniatures in the UK when they arrive with Footsaw. Are you planning? Are they planning on picking up your vehicle sets as well? Yes. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> just because there's, there is some nice vehicles in there, but I'm one of those people that's. It's a lot of money for shipping, you know, from on a limited budget, and I am on a limited budget for gaming, so that'll be a nice nice one because it was some really nice you did have some nice vehicles especially the little bird because trying to get a hold of a one a, to scale little bird yeah yeah that was is a like trying to find rocking like trying to find rock and horse manure 
so that little bird is done Excuse in one. Me, it, it's done in one fiftieth scale. Mm-hmm. I, I all my vehicles are done in one fiftieth. I think one fifty six is too small, personally, mm-hmm. and I think one forty eighth uh, is too big. That's again yeah. my own personal taste. So I thought one fiftieth was good, though I do have some one forty eighth scale models that I use yes, from time to time awesome. because there's nobody else that makes them. But yeah, one fiftieth is the scale that that's the scale that the little bird is in, and the Hummer, and, and all all yeah. different ones. Excellent. Yeah, because I've got sitting on my painting table here still gray primed as a T fourteen from Empress. Yep. Yep, the Empress yep. T14, which is a really nice... I recommend that kit for it's a tank and um, the Tiger. It's a pretty one. big miniature, right? It is. It's quite... It really is, but it's a nice, nice miniature as well. It was one, two, three... The hull, the side pieces, the tracks, and then the turret with the bits on. So it's it's quite 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 a chunky piece of resin as well, because it's all resin. Um, the gun barrel's metal. And I think the antennas and stuff were the only bits of metal. But everything else is resin, but it's a really nice Russian tank. So I have oh, yeah. to say, you know, um, companies like yours, Tim, have really driven the modern market. Because if you think about it, two years ago, maybe three, there was not much as far as offerings in the modern era, uh, especially in vehicles and stuff. And now we're seeing, you know, all these companies offering such a wide variety of stuff. So it's it's really nice to see that kind of growth in offerings, you know, because for a while there, we were using die cast uh, Humvees yeah. from Menards, you know, that are totally out of scale. Um, but, you know, that's what you had. My first, my first miniature games with uh, modern miniature games with micro machines. <laughs> Uh, I remember that. That's like mm-hmm. back in the 90s. There was nothing yep. back then. Yep. So uh, I want to change gears again. And, Jim, I want to give you the floor. And I, we'd like to have a kind of a roundup recap of how your first session of the RPG went. Oh, okay. Um, well, uh, like, I'm, like we've been saying, we've – We've been trying to run uh, two uh, Skype streams a week. Not Skype, I'm sorry, Twitch streams a week. Um, we haven't been 100% on that, but we are trying to get better. Uh, so the problem with mine on Sundays is um, we run web-based war games. So if you ever want to try Panzer Leader, we can do it literally any Saturday. Uh, I've completely rebuilt the game where it'll play on, on the web. Um so I, I'm sorry to cut you off. What do you no, use? No. What do you? What's your the platform for that? <laughs> Here we go. Micros, Microsoft. Excel. I'm just going to put my feet up. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Microsoft Never. Excel. It's, we'll we'll it's, talk later. No, no, no. It's okay. It's it's um. There's a lot of choices out there. We do it in Microsoft Excel, and we use like some web conference software. We might move it over to Discord shortly or whatever. Um, we're trying to get it in such a way where uh, kind of like a shared desktop sort of a, a, a bit of software where people can move their own pieces around or whatever. Um, and, uh, yeah, we, it, the, the advantage there is – and this does lead into the question because we do – because we run uh, HK Ops the same way. Um the advantage there is that everybody can see the same screen at once. Everybody can control, you know, the mouse and keyboard if they choose to, or if not, they can just tell me where they want to move their person and you know their character or whatever, and they move their little playing pieces around. Everyone's on the same call. We have Skype. We have uh, sorry. We have audio. We have visual. We have chat. You know, um, and it works. And it works with a minimum uh, of software, in fact, no software, that people have to download on their own computers. So a lot of times, you know, we were exploring other options. You know, there's there's whatever it is, D20, virtual tabletop, all this other right. stuff. And there's all this coding that has to go into it. And the people that you're playing with have to have the same thing. And there's all this setup they have to do on their end. Vassal, I'm sorry, I'm not a fan of Vassal. I know there's people out there that like Vassal. Um the problem is, and this is just something that I'm kind of a bugbear about or whatever, is that when people, I, as far as what most of my hobby is, is I usually design my own games. And even a game that I take off the shelf, like, you know, Panzer Leader, um, is being heavily reworked. Panzer Leader is a great game. Panzer Blitz was a great game. Tragically flawed, out of the box. Needs a lot of love. Arab is really worse. They finally got the actual system right. So when we're playing Panzer Leader, for example, what we're really playing is Arab is really worse. And this is most people who still play Panzer Leader. You're playing Arab Israeli Wars with a World War II skin on top of it. Um, 
the problem there is that that doesn't really plug into Vassal because, you know, when you go to play Pendulator Leader on Vassal, you're playing with chapter and verse out of the original 1974 Avalon Hill rulebook. And it's fun once in a while, but the game, again, is kind of broken. Um, so that's why we picked this very kind of agnostic, very easy to use. Sometimes it's a little bit more work, but it's a very easy to use, very... Um, uh, very generic. Basically, if you have Microsoft, you know, which everyone does, um, you can participate in our games. And uh, we've had some monster games, and we've mm-hmm. had some little fun games, and we've had some, you know, we did Gold Beach. All of, <laughs> well, no, half of Gold Beach. It took nine and a half hours uh, in Panzer Leader. We did all of Omaha Beach, took 25 hours. We did Valley of Tears in 1973, uh, Golden Heights, took uh, seven and a half hours or something like that. You know, it's and then uh, we did a six-hour game recently, G. I think yes, we did. did uh, I was going to say uh, Market Garden, didn't we? Yeah, you? we did Nine we did Megan, Val- the river Val- crossing of the ball. Wow. Yeah. Um, we had to do that one in two pieces. Uh, yeah. But yeah, that turned out to be like something like six hours, which is big for a Valorant victory game. Um, but that's the platform that we use. Uh, and we, I, I go through all that rigmarole uh, because when we run HK Ops the same way. So HK Ops is a role-playing game. I get, okay, so I'm sorry. The original point of the question was um, we've been running these games on Sundays for a modern theme. You can play mo- you can play Panzer Leader in the modern era. I've retooled Valor and Victory by Barry Doyle into the modern era. We do um, Vietnam Valor and Victory. We do uh, Falklands Valor and Victory, and we've done Lebanon 1982 Valor and Victory. We've done 1991, and we're working on um, Ukraine 2014-2015 in Panzer Leader. Oh, wow. So th- the problem is we also have Air War C-21. We also have Naval Command by Rory Crab for um, for modern naval combat or whatever. But really, it's been just those two things. Panzer Leader, Valor and Victory, Valor and Victory, Panzer Leader, Panzer Leader, back to Valor and Victory. <laughs> and after that was fun for like six months. But then I was like, you know what? Um, just to make sure that we don't get stale, I wanted a third option. So I put it out to the group a lot of times, and there were some great uh, suggestions out there. Car Wars was brought up. Battletech was brought up. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know if that's really going to work too much on this kind of thing. Um, we were talking maybe about uh, Ultra Combat. But Ultra Combat's got a lot of cards in it, and cards is one of the things that this kind of a platform sort of trips over a little. Um, we could probably fix it because there are some cards in here where C21. So I was like, okay, what can we do now? That's going to be a third option to kind of make these Sunday streams a little bit more, um, you know, not quite so samey, you know, week after week after week. And we started playing around with the idea of an RPG. So HK Ops is a uh, hunter killer ops. It's a very, very generic title. Uh, purposefully, is um, a very uh, kind of a generic role-playing system that we have for, you know, modern combat. Um, There are three basic uh, ideas. You play formal military, you could play uh, PMC, or you could play like a post-apocalyptic setting, like whatever happened to the world just happened, and now you're trying to, you know, look around, look for resources or whatever, fight other people. Um, The group that I had selected a private military contractor. So we ran our first session. It ran about six or seven hours um, last Sunday. Uh, It was a big session. Um, live on Sky, uh, live on Twitch and YouTube and everything else. Uh, we got our group assembled. We got a built. We have our fictional PMC company that's Phalanx Multinational. We're uh, located outside of Alexandria in uh, Virginia, so they're right in that little area. You know, if you guys know that area, they're right near DC. Annapolis, Quantico, um, Aberdeen testing ground. They're right in that little area of, you know, in the know. They're not in the Beltway, but they're right outside the Beltway. So they're close enough to the action, so to speak, you know, political and financial without being kind of dragged into it. They also have an office, uh, we decided, uh, outside of Edinburgh so that we have, um, you know, we have some British players that are playing. So we have, you know, you know, we have facilities that, people can take equipment and gear from on both sides of the water and uh yeah we started our first mission um sort of a simple introductory mission uh down in um cartel land in mexico uh that went pretty well uh we had our first completely unplanned firefight um anyone who's ever run, everyone who's ever run an rpg before knows that you know you can yeah. set up a pretty basic um you know outline or whatever and then sure enough your players go in a different direction um so i'm literally there in excel like drawing a map live on twitch um like drawing boxes 
<laughs> little sheep tool in Excel. Uh, we got it to work, though. And um, we didn't reach the main uh, encounter at the end of the game because, like, again, by then we had been on for, you know, seven hours. And it was getting to be, like, past midnight in some parts of the world where we had some players. So uh, next Sunday, uh, that's going to be, um, I guess, the... Tomorrow's the third, so I guess um, November tenth. We're going to um, finish up that game uh, with uh, now that we finally found what we're looking for. We know where it is now. It's going to be a lot more of a tactical strike. This system is heavily based on again because this is not. Like Tim was saying before, we do it for the enjoyment of the players. This is not something we're going to sell by any stretch of the imagination. I hope to never even write a rule set on this. I've had enough of my rules for a while. <laughs> I understand. Dark Star is like 200 and 300 pages and counting as far as the rule book goes. We are uh, we, we drew heavily from the old storyteller White Wolf system back in 1991. We drew from Millennium's End. We drew from Twilight 2000. We drew from uh, Faza Renegade Legions, the old... Um, yep. The old uh, game that was tragically uh, put out of business by uh, some other companies that I probably should mention. Um, and, you know, we, we kind of like grab little bits from here and there and we kind of cobble together this or I kind of cobble together this little system. And so far it's running. It's, 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 it's running pretty great. Uh For a modern military role playing game, we do have some hurdles. Um, this is a realistic-ish look at what a modern firefight looks like. So there's no health packs. You know, there's no resurrection vials. There's no healing spells. You get hit by a bullet, and even if you're wearing armor, and even if you're, you know, you're probably out of the game. You may not be dead, but, you know, a 45 caliber or a 762, you know, com block bullet to a bulletproof vest is still going to crack a couple ribs. You're going to take organ damage. You're going to take all kinds of interest. It's there to save your life. It's not there to let you keep fighting. Um, there's also, of course, no supernatural abilities or sci-fi stuff that you see in a lot of role-playing games. No fireballs, no lightning bolts, no dragons, no sorcerers. So the... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? The, um, the intellectual real estate that most role-playing games that include those kind of elements have devoted to those kind of those kinds of things has to be filled up by something else. And what most games have done in the past, like I'll mention Phoenix Command from back in the day. Anyone who's ever played Phoenix Command knows how this works. That is a game where um, one of the stats on your rifle is time of flight, where it measures in tenths of a second how long it takes yeah. your bullet to hit certain targets at certain ranges. Grain weights of the individual bullets. Um, you know how many inches your fighting knife is. I mean, how many laces are in your boot? I mean, come on, guys. It's <laughs> get a life. <laughs> you know, uh, it, it's a touch much. So I've. And then, of course, you know, again, we, we kind of base a lot of the base DNA off of um, the original storyteller system back in the early 1990s, not the new one, The World of Darkness. That's that's another whole kettle of fish I probably shouldn't get into. But the original gothic punk White Wolf from 1991, 1992, Vampire the Masquerade, believe it or not, Werewolf the Apocalypse, Mage the Ascension. Those are the three gold standard games from 1991, 92, 93. Yep. That's the base DNA for some of the game. I mean, it's not, it doesn't really look like it, but if you look at all the character sheets, you'll notice some of the same DNA. So that game is very storyteller driven, very narrative driven. And the, the, the weapons in that game are, are, are the weapons in my game are, does it really matter if you're carrying an M4A1 or an M16A2 or a, you know, look, you have an assault carbine. You have a assault rifle light, assault rifle medium, assault rifle heavy, whatever, you know. And it's all based on ammunition types, you know, like 7.62 is a medium, 556 NATO ball is a light, you know, and up to the machine guns, pistols, revolvers. And it's, it's we're just trying to get because not everyone in my group is like is a former is former military. So we're trying to get this kind of light, kind of cool, uh, story focused, character focused. Um, I'm not real worried about the tactical uh, minutia of the game. Like right now, we have a little bit of a discussion about what kind of a bonus a bipod should get versus a laser scope versus a starlight scope versus a telescopic scope on a sniper rifle. And I'm like, I'm much more worried about why your character is there. <laughs> why he decided to join this company, what's in it for him. I mean, yes, it's a paycheck, but on top of that, you know, what motivates him to do this job when he could easily be an analyst at a bank or, you know, 
work at a factory or who knows what, you know, do a normal nine to five kind of a job. What makes your character do this kind of, you know, absurd, crazy stuff where you can be shot and killed almost, you know, as like part of your normal day to day. Um, so, yeah, like I said, we picked PMCs. Um, because it's like that happy medium between the complete freedom of post-apocalyptic and the very restrictive part of, uh, of former military. Formal military setting makes great war games. I have found, and I've been doing this since 1985, I have found that formal military can sometimes be tough to do in a role-playing setting. Not impossible, but tough. There are several constraints uh, that you have to deal with. Um, and if you don't pay attention to those constraints, you're not doing the military correctly. Uh, when you're playing, when you're in the military, and you know, <laughs> anyone has been in the military, you know, you guys can tell, tell me about this. When you're in the military, you take orders, and uh-huh. you know, player agency, which is a key factor of any role playing game, kind of flies out the window a little bit. Um, you can give a little bit of leeway, like you guys are so elite and so badass that, uh, but at the same time, you don't get to decline a mission or whatever. You know, you get pointed to a grid reference and you go there and you execute the mission. There's going to be a party leader. That party leader is either the senior staff NCO or the senior NCO or the officer, and that's it. You know, there's no argument. Arguing against your the party leader is literally a federal crime at that point because you're in time of war. And PMCs we kind of picked because that was going to be kind of like the, the middle ground where we could be a little um, – I mean, it's still a, a paramilitary organization, but we're trying to be a little bit more um, lenient with those kind of elements. People can play uh, from characters from any background, um, different countries, uh, different, you know, pretty much whatever they want. So, so far we have a South African, we have uh, a Dane, we have um, a, a British, uh, a member from, uh, I think, Second Lancasters, and yeah. uh, two Americans in our group. So, yeah, it's going pretty well so far. We haven't completely finished our first story arc, um, I, but we're going to finish that again, uh, eight days as of this recording, and we're going to see how it finishes up. Um, but we've had our first kind of a, a test. Uh, we had our first test with uh, somebody in Australia, our, our friend Dylan, LSR 2590, uh, three weeks ago. Now it's just with one player, two characters in Syria, and we pretty much just had a, a quick kind of a hunter-killer kind of mission. You get dropped off in a helicopter, here's the grid preference, get from point A to point B, overcome obstacles along the way, and then have a firefight. A little bit of investigation, but now we have a full party where there's interpersonal rivalries, there's already a little bit of a love triangle in the story. Again, we're going for much more of a storyteller kind of a feel. Because, let's face it, if you want hardcore military war gaming on a skirmish level there's already games out there for that let's let's play skirmish sank and let's play you know let's play fistful of lead and you know um there's there, there's things for that we're going for a very um without letting you get completely into a soap opera but we are going for a storyteller uh, a narrative character driven kind of a feel every story is going to build into the next one every story is going to have personal threads and personal story arcs from a writer's perspective in from a uh, the players aren't so much players as fellow story you know assistant storytellers co-collaborators in let's build a character arc let's make let's close those character arcs let's have set up some payoffs let's have an actual narrative let's write a script let's pretend we're making a movie not a game as far as how we're um, how we're approaching this so we haven't had our first main big firefight but we have had a small one uh we did have two small wounds we had some you know one shot one kill sniper hits we had some silent takedowns um while i'm not that worried about that part of the game as far as how it performs mechanically so far that's going pretty well there are a couple tweaks in there but what i'm much more um happy about is uh, the group we have and um how well it's uh, performing so far in a um Again, like 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 a storytelling uh, sort of a framework. So uh, it's, it's a partial report because again, we're not through our first session, or we're through our first we're not through our first story arc. But um, so far, it's, it's so far it's not going bad. And yeah, we'll see where it goes from there. Awesome. All right, uh, Ralph. Any final thoughts? No, I've got I've got nothing. You got nothing <laughs> at all. Nothing. I've got nothing at all. The only thing I would possibly suggest for from Jim' point of view is Jim. What I'll do at some point is I'll get you to have a look at Rule Twenty because I think it might help, especially with the role playing 
bits of it. Um, it's what we used. It's what I used for when I ran my Star Wars game, which I'm busy rewriting and working on. And it's what we use for my D and D game that I'm part of. Um, and it is a platform built for role playing, so it's got. So you can actually set it up so it doesn't have a character sheet, but it's got all of the digital dice rolling. So I think for new players that aren't used to rolling, you know, for, say, doing all of the math and things like that um, and rolling bucketfuls of dice, you can, say, just roll 10d6 and it'll roll, or 10d10 and it'll roll them for them and things like that. So it might be something that might help your players a little bit more. But I can show you it at some point. I, I found just, that my players prefer to roll their own dice. Yeah. It's um, just it might be something that, that possibly can help. I do uh, understand where you're coming from, and I do understand that there's no intellectual difference or no actual. No. But the idea of picking up a fist, especially with the storyteller system, mm-hmm. one of the genius things about the storyteller system, and this is, goes back to the old Mark Reinhog and Sam Chubb uh, White Wolf days, is yes. the way their system works. It's not like D&D where you have a D20. And no. okay, you add one, you add subtract two, you add five, you divide by two, you multiply by the price of tea in China. There's all these things, and you wind up with still one D20. Now, there's a bunch of modifiers on there. And you know when you're about to launch a big attack because you, you know that you're subtracting or you're adding 15 to that D20. And you're like, oh, yeah, I'm really going to mess you up here. And you roll that one D20. It's a subtle thing, but I think it really works with, with um, whatchamacallit, uh, with the storyteller system. You should just add dice to your pool. So you have, uh, say you're taking a rifle shot. You have two dice in dexterity. You have three dice in firearms. Okay, you have five dice. Oh, then you have a rifle scope. Okay, you have two dice. You have a bipod. You have a dice for that. You have this. You have that. The enemy's surprised. The enemy has no cover. This, that. Before you know it, you have like 15 dice in your hand. You know, and the enemy has his two dice in... It's not dodge, because you can't dodge gunfire, but it's uh, it's like cover and concealment plus wits or something. And you've got... Yeah. He's got like three dice. And the same thing happens in reverse. When the enemy's coming at you... And you say, okay, you know, pick up your, your armor plus your defense plus your whatever, and you have like three dice in your hand. And you're like, uh, and the enemy picks up a mug of dice. Mm-hmm. And then you start shaking it. And just like this physical weight in your hand, like this is coming at you, buddy. You know, holding on to your ankles, <laughs> here it comes. Um, <laughs> uh, it's one I thing know. that I've always felt like it, it really works with storyteller system. And generally, again, that's kind of where we're taking some of our DNA from, full disclosure. Mm-hmm. Um and the, the, a lot of the players I have are uh, are um, what's my calls are, are old, longtime veterans of that. We played that game literally since it came out, so we're coming up on uh, thirty years now. Yes. Um, so you know who knows, but uh, mm-hmm. yeah, we're running okay for now, and um, we'll see uh, we'll yeah. see where it goes from here. Yeah, we haven't even finished our first story arc, so we'll <laughs> there you go. It's just, it's just the thing because I know I know what it's like rolling the dice and stuff. Is I did play original Vampire the Masquerade. I have the collector's edition of Werewolf, Mage, and Vampire in slipcases that were produced when they did the collector's edition sitting on a shelf in the back so yeah nice. and I played Mind's Eye Theater as well so I did the live role playing as well for Mage um, and talking about buckets of dice the original Star Wars game which was the one I ran oh, I yeah. ran the, old, the uh, West End systems. games I yeah. ran that as on, on roll 20 which I found was much easier than throwing buckets of dice because you throw buckets of dice in that as well you so throw it's, buckets it's of dice and you talk about the West End game Yes. Yeah, the West End games, you roll buckets of dice, and then you have to add up the result, which I always found tedious. Yeah, yes, you do. Uh, you know, you like your, do your target number is 30 for a really difficult roll. You roll like 10 dice. Now mm-hmm. you have to add up 1 plus 2 plus 5 plus 6 plus 4. That's plus why four. roll 20 was really useful, because it did it all for you. You just rolled the dice. Yeah. But, um, With this, it might be worth to have a look at at some point. It's just, just, to, just to suggest, because then I know... Uh, our GM does it for us for us, D&D as he rolls the dice off screen yep. so the GM rolls his dice so we don't know what he's rolling but at least he can then see what we're rolling and that's part of the things I think with some role playing games it does help now if you you know we all trust our players so you know it's it's something that we're not worried about but it does give you that 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 track of well of things of things like initiative and stuff like that so it's it's just something to think about though Jim it's not you know not be on an edge or it might be just something that's easier for you to to look at in the future yeah we'll uh, have to give it a thought so um jim any final thoughts oh uh, no that was it i talked uh, too much already <laughs> <laughs> all right tim uh do you want to close out the show what do you what it what do you have for final thoughts, hobbying, any future prospects, anything you'd like the people out there to know about? 
Well, we are the SBS that we put out uh, will be it's on pre-order right now and they should be sending out shipping out the end of this week so i'm very excited about that so we did sbs in syria we're currently working on uh, u.s navy seals in syria uh, and that those are being sculpted as we speak cool so i'm excited about that the the next year I, you know, I don't know. I mean, we're constantly looking for new things to, to, to do. And a lot of, yeah, I've had a lot. Yeah, I know. I know. I've had a lot of people ask me about that. Um, what was that? I didn't hear any black hawk. A black oh. hawk. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. I got a 172 so, black hawk at uh, Historicon, but it's, it's more of a, it's not really a miniature. It's more of a, is that the uh, die cast one? Yeah. Yeah. I've got one too. Um, I can probably turn it into a miniature. In fact, that's on my new, latest project thread. But it's uh, it's freaking huge, man! Holy crap! <laughs> yeah, yeah so really, a, a well done Blackhawk would be really, really, really nice. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. yep. <laughs> I get that same answer from everybody. Yep, yep. No, yep, no, yep. You, you're not the first to <laughs> ask me. Definitely. Uh, we, I do have when I first started. I do have the helicopter that that was inspired by uh, the drawings and stuff that was used for the Osama bin Laden raid. Uh huh. And oh, the, I can the always, buckle, yeah, yeah. I could always, uh, I can always modify that, but that has that was created for FDM printing. It was not created for resin based casting so some things would need to be changed but that's definitely not out of question gotcha we're talking about what scale for the blackhawk i mean theoretically one one fiftieth Oof. yeah i've got a one four i've got the 140 to tell you black hawk kit sitting here which lift with lift your kit. lift with your knees <laughs> that's gonna be a big ass gonna, so would you oh. do a, a standard model tim or would you do like an m model so a special operations model like a pay I would, or i would do a special operations okay. yeah. excellent yeah i mean that's a big huge project to undertake um well the special operations one that's gonna be a pretty much a uh I, correct, correct me if i'm wrong a regular blackhawk yeah. but it has like additional additions and components and systems mounted onto it correct uh so well how- the m model um the special operations model you have the pave hawk which is the air force version which has the refueling probe it's a glass cockpit it has uh air to ground radar you know uh, ground avoidance radar and stuff like that uh the yeah, m model so is essentially a- the same thing without the in-flight refueling uh the stabilator that's the back fin is the rectangular one versus the rounded one um okay. engines are a little upgraded pods as well hasn't it Chief? what's that oh uh, yeah Got so the pods are- on the side well, the pods on the side um, are – it's called the ESSS, and that is on mm-hmm. all Blackhawks. It's just a matter of mm-hmm. – it, it's an attachable, detachable system. Um, yeah. So uh, you can put that on any Blackhawk. Um, it's just this setup essentially in the M model. Uh, f- I think the fuel tanks are the new resealable ones. Um and you know it's all it's a pretty much a glass cockpit all digital um with the grout avoidance radar and all that good stuff that you don't have in like the a models and in the you know later iterations of the black hawk so So outside of the engines i'm I'm, I'm not from a military perspective but from a modeling perspective outside of the engines and the and the uh stabilizer fin everything else is more or less external attachments Uh, i'm just wondering if the kit could be like with an option yeah, I mean the kit it's, could be. I mean the, the nose uh, is a little different because of the the you know avionics, um, okay. but I mean it's not that big of a deal. You know if no, well, yeah, once you get into the actual shape of the hull, yeah, then it's the, the basic yeah. airframe itself is the same. Yeah, yeah, I've got the I've got the U U eight sixty slash M eight sixty Blackhawk Night Raid Italia kit sitting yep. right next to us. Yeah, yep. that's the and, one and, I've got. And that's that what was the reason why I haven't really done a Blackhawk is because to what you just said is that I've got it in one forty eighth, and mm-hmm. it's much cheaper to get a plastic kit uh, in one forty eighth than it would be to create your own. Yeah, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Yeah, the only problem with using a model kit is just durability, you know, honestly. Yeah. Yeah, And honestly, you would run into that same problem for producing a miniatures-based game kit. At that scale, you're still going to have durability issues. Um, 
you know, what would you make the rotor blades out of? It would have to be a plastic kit. If you went with metal, you would never be able to keep them straight. If you went with, you could possibly do it in resin, but then you're looking at, you know, I dropped that rotor head once. I'm going to shatter a blade. Um, you know, you could do a big piece of, because I've seen it, um, Ivan on the Spectre miniatures uh-huh. Facebook group was doing some stuff with those um, conversions of the little bird, little bird from the Academia, Academy M6s, uh-huh. you know, the, the kits. And we were looking at buying big sheets of pers- like acrylic sheet circles because uh-huh. you can get them cut out to the rotor blade side and then it looks like the and then trying to get some etching on it to make it look like the rotor blades are actually spinning yeah yeah you could always do that yeah but i wonder if it, i mean that's a good idea but 156 that thing would be like 18 inches across yeah you have a and huge rotor disc yeah it is but um they were on the uk you can i can order them to scale in size and i think they were three quid so from a from a realistic from the postings uh, from an actual play side having a, Bla- a blackhawk a chinook an apache Oof, a chinook. Uh, yeah could you imagine a 148 or 150 a chinook um that would be your table. Table. That would be uh, your would, table. but you know from a playability mm. standpoint it's almost not worth doing um, because you're not going to use it to play with other than, okay, I'm going to insert my team and then the Blackhawk's going to fly off the table. Okay, I'm going to put it into an orbit around the objective to provide overfire. Um, but other than that, you're really not going to use it. So I have 3D printed a crashed Blackhawk as an objective marker. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, but be, because. You know, you could build a Blackhawk model, but what are you going to do with it in the game? You know, it's either going to insert, exfil, or, you know, it's going to be down. So it's it's one of those things, how often are you realistically going to use it? So, Like, I, at a Soricon, I just went out and bought one. Yeah. Like, Fields of Honor or whatever. It's It looks fine, and it's it's only 72, because most of my monitors are 1 to 72, 20 millimeter. Uh-huh. And even a 20 millimeter, that thing is bigger than anything else i have yeah by twice it yeah. is, i mean some people don't realize how big aircraft are compared to tanks this thing is huge yeah and that's just a one to 72 yeah. i bought it it cost me like 30 bucks or whatever fully painted glass canopy whatever it looks fine but how many how often am i going to use it it doesn't matter because i didn't spend any time into it yeah exactly um yeah so 30 bucks it was a it was a steal of 30 um uh, as far as using scale models for um, helicopter miniatures, I have four Revel one to one hundreds for my fifteen millimeter Vietnam for UH one uh, UH one Hueys. Uh-huh. And uh, after every game, it was like you know budgeting an extra hour to kind of glue the the rocket pods back on the side <laughs> of the, those Hueys because at least something broke. Yeah. Plus, yeah. it took like a day to build each one because they're model kits. They come with like one hundred and seventeen pieces or something. Yeah. Um, it, they were they were tough, and I, of course, because I I needed an army of these things, I had to build four of them. So they're one a week in my life, you know. Um, it's it's tough. Yeah. And um, at 15 mil, you can get away with it. I mean, you look at the Flames of War Battlefront uh, one to 100 Hueys. They're a lot chunkier. They're not gonna. They're literally designed properly, correctly. So as tabletop miniatures, they're yeah. game pieces or yeah. whatever. These Rebel one to 100s were they look a little, they look a lot nicer, but man, are they fragile. Especially when they're up on a flying stand, you know, someone bumps the table, they're going to fall over. Um, yeah, a one, to, a 1 to 50 or a 1 to 56 or, you know, whatever scale we're talking about, Blackhawk would be absolutely monstrous. And if you want to have that flying over your table, your flight stand is, number one, going to have to weigh like two pounds to so make sure the thing isn't top heavy. And number two, it's going to have to have a big base so that, again, it doesn't tip over, you know, yeah. too easily because that thing's going to have to tip over once. And that's and, it. And, uh, yeah, you're going to lose a, a tail rotor, a rotor's going to bend, one of the weapons on the side's going to break off, landing gear. Because the Blackhawk's gear doesn't retract, right? It no, it out. does not. Mm-mm. Yeah. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, we're going to call it at that. We want to thank our special guest, Tim, from Foot Sword Miniatures, Foot Sword North America. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. And, of course, we are going to uh, head on out and... Uh, For Ralph and Jim, this is G, and you have been listening to the Sitret Modern Podcast.